This talk is about promise problems and constraint satisfaction. The best example of that is promise coloring. Given a free colorable graph, can you at least find a 100 coloring, for example? So you're promised that the input graph is free colorable, but you don't know a coloring of it. And the question is, can you at least find something as weak as a 100 coloring in polynomial time? And this question is over. Another such problem was considered recently by Austrian Grusfan and Hostad, namely, given a KCNF formula that is G-satisfiable, can you at least find a one-satisfying assignment? And here G-satisfying means that the assignment has to satisfy at least G-literals in every close. They proved that this problem is solvable in polynomial time if G over K is at least one half and then P hard otherwise. And they dubbed this 2 plus epsilon sub is NP hard, because it generalizes the fact that 2 sub is easy and then 3 sub is NP hard. As you see, these are kind of approximation problems, but we always compare some strong notion of satisfaction with a weak notion of satisfaction. And this allows to use some uh, tools more usual for normal CSPs, uh, such as abstract algebra. And this is one of the motivations for studying promise constraint satisfaction is to introduce new views and new tools to uh, approximation theory. In this presentation, I will talk about one such problem, but I will focus on, on this algebraic framework for proving hardness of approximation. So the problem we considered is very similar to the problem before. The only difference is that instead of a Boolean domain, we now consider any fixed finite domain. So variables now take values in the domain from 1 to d, for some fixed constant d, the literals now of the form xi is in some set s. So these are arbitrary unary constraints. And then, as before, closes are sets of k literals, instances are conjunctions of closes, and g satisfying means that we have to satisfy at least g literals in each close. And the problem is again, given a g satisfiable instance, find at least one satisfying sign. In this problems, you could vary some of the definitions. For example, instead of uh, one satisfying assignment, you could ask for a C satisfying assignment for some constant C, or instead of literals uh, with any sets S, you could ask for some sets of a specific size. Uh, but this turns out not to change much. Uh, all these problems uh, with some fairly easy reduction turn out to be equivalent. So I would focus on, on this, this version here. And long story short, what we show is that the problem is solvable in polynomial time when g over k is over some threshold and it's n hard otherwise. As you see, this generalizes the previous results because for the Boolean domain, for d equal to 2, uh, this threshold is exactly one half. Nevertheless, uh, to prove uh, the hardness results, we had to use new tools, we had to extend the algebraic framework a little. So let's first see the algorithm. This is essentially Papa Dimitri's algorithm for two sets. Uh, it turns out to work for this problem as well. Uh, so we start with an arbitrary assignment. And while this assignment is not one satisfying, we randomly modify it. So we pick an arbitrary false close which means that every literal in that close is falsified. So we randomly choose a literal from that close, and then we randomly choose a new value for the variable in that literal to make it true. And we repeat this over and over until uh, the assignment we have is one satisfying. So this might seem quite naive. Uh, we're really not doing anything, just uh, randomly changing the assignment we have until we're satisfied. Uh, but it turns out it works, uh, and it finishes an expected polynomial time. The argument is a bit tricky, but also quite easy. Namely, we know there is some G-satisfying assignment Y. We don't know what this assignment is, but we promise there is one. So we can look at, in theory, what's the hemming distance between our assignment and this assignment Y. We can calculate the probability uh, in each step, that this distance will increase and the probability that it decreases. And when you do that, it turns out that uh, assuming g over k is over this threshold, 
uh, that the Hamming distance will decrease in expectation. And even when g over k is exactly on this threshold, uh, this means that the Hamming distance, the change in it, will be expected to be zero, but this means it's an unbiased random walk, uh, so we also expect this to reach zero in quadratic time. So that's the whole analysis. Uh, the algorithm itself is even simpler, so I think it's quite surprising that as soon as we cross this threshold, as soon as g over k is strictly less than 1 minus 1 over t, the problem suddenly becomes NP-hot, even though just before it had such an easy algorithm. This algorithm here is randomized, uh, but we also have uh, deterministic algorithms. One way to do this is uh, by just running a linear programming relaxation. This works immediately when g over k is strictly larger than this threshold. When g over k is exactly the threshold, then uh, we have to do some iterative rounding. But these are still fairly standard techniques. So we can now turn to proving hardness. Uh, as usual, in approximation theory, we reduce from some version of label cover. Uh, if you don't remember, label cover is just this uh, satisfaction problem whose definition only uses sets and functions. So we have variables, every variable has a domain. Here the domain is called the set of labels. Uh, so for every variable we have to select one label from the set of labels under constraints, and the constraints here are functions, which said that uh, if we select this label from L1, then we have to select this label from L2. This figure here is an example. You have sets of labels L1, L2, L3, some functions between some of those sets of labels, and I've selected a satisfying assignment with green diamonds here. We select one label from each set, such that all the constraints are satisfied. As you might know, one version of the PCP theorem says that Given a fully satisfiable instance, it is NP hard to satisfy even just a small constant fraction of it. So for every epsilon, however small, uh, you can even fix the size of the sets of labels to be some constant, and it's going to be NP hard even to distinguish fully satisfiable instances from those where not even a small fraction is satisfiable. A slightly more combinatorial corollary of this is that the following is NP-hard. So given a fully satisfiable instance, it's NP-hard to select from each set of labels a subset of at most seven labels, so that what you select for i intersects what you select for j after you apply the function pi. And why is that? Simply because if you could select such sets uh, of at most seven labels, then you could pick one of those labels at random and then every constraint is satisfied with probability at least 1 over 49, so you've satisfied some constant fraction of all constraints. And we know this is np hard by the PCP theorem. So that's one corollary, uh, which will be important throughout, so I will keep it on top of the slides. And with this example, I can state what the gist is of the abstract algebraic approach to promise constraint satisfaction problem. Namely, arguably, the fundamental theorem here is that every PCSP is equivalent to some label cover version. So to some problem of the following form, given a fully satisfiable instance of label cover, find a way to select for each variable i a something on li, so that uh, what you select for i agrees in some way with what you selected for j. And the something here could be many different things. For example, it could be subsets, and then we have something similar as above, uh, except that uh, the, the, the constraint here is not that uh, what you select for i intersects what you selected for j, it has to be exactly the same when you look uh, at the image for pi. Uh, another important example of what somethings on a lie could be uh, is distributions, so it could be distributions on a line, and this gives a version of label cover which is solvable in polynomial time by linear programming. Uh, this will be important at the end, I'll return to that. But uh, really it turns out to be interesting to look at this abstractly, that some things really could be anything, 
And you only have to define how pi transform uh, those things. This sets up a framework, for example, for showing hardness of approximation. What we have to do is we have to understand what the sum things are, how pi transforms them, so what constraints they satisfy. Then we get some version of label cover, and what we have to do is just to show that this specific version of label cover is in p-hard. And the free RM gives us a concrete definition for what the sum things are. Uh, for example, in our sets of problems, these will be functions with L inputs, um, which map G satisfying K tuples to one satisfying K tuples. The exact definition here won't be important for the talk. It's only important that uh, the somethings will be functions with L inputs, uh, which somehow encode those strong satisfying conditions and the weak satisfying conditions. So we have this version of label cover, which is NP-hard, and we know that set set is equivalent to a version of label cover with polymorphisms, so with some functions with L inputs. Uh, so find a way to select for each variable i a polymorphism fi on li inputs so that uh, pi of fi is equal to fj. Pi of fi here means the function you get from fi by rewiring the inputs according to the function pi. And this has to be exactly the function fj. So how is this helpful? Uh, for example, you could consider the case when uh, all polymorphisms are projections. So suppose we could show that all polymorphisms of set sets are projections, which means uh, some functions of a very simple form, f of x1 to xl, are just outputs one of the inputs. In that case, selecting f, selecting such a polymorphism, is the same as selecting the label small l from the set of labels. So this would be exactly the same as just solving the label cover instance in the usual sense. And this is, of course, NP-hard. This is NP-hard even, even without using the PCP theorem. So this uh, condition suffices, for example, for the problem of uh, four-coloring, three-colorable graphs. In that case, the polymorphisms are projections. This is uh, fairly easy to show. And because of the, that, the problem is NP-hard. Uh, this is not true for set set, but there are some more general conditions. For example, if we could show that all polymorphisms of set set only depend on a few inputs. So every polymorphism f is in fact just a function of some of the inputs and all the other inputs can be disregarded. Then selecting such a function f is the same as selecting this subset of uh, inputs. And as we know, this, this is NP-hard. It's NP-hard to select a bounded size uh, set of labels from this set. So if we could share this, we would be happy, we would be finished, uh, the problem would be NP-hard. Uh, there are some other conditions. If we could prove that there's a small fixing set, for example, so a small set such that fixing uh, some inputs there makes the remainder of the function constant, uh, this would be enough. Or more generally, if you could fix some of the inputs such that uh, the output avoids one possible value, uh, and if you could show that there aren't many disjoint avoiding sets, that this would be enough to show NP hardness. Unfortunately, none of this condition are true for set set. In fact, uh, the closer you get uh, to this threshold for G over K, uh, the more badly the more badly all of these conditions fail. Instead, what we could prove for set set is something uh, a bit more subtle. Uh, we call this uh, having small smug sets. So this means you could set some of the inputs to A and have the output A, uh, even though all of the other inputs are different from A. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, for a set to be smug, we only have to show it for one uh, input vector. This turns out to be a little bit problematic, and let me explain why. Let's first see what happens when f only depends on uh, a small set of inputs. So if f only depends on some small set uh, s uh, of the inputs, then I claim that pi of f only depends on the image of that set, pi of s. So on the figure here we have 
a set L of uh, five labels, a set L prime of three labels, uh, some function pi between them, and then pi of f is defined as follows: pi of f of, um, on input x y z uh, is defined as f of x x y y z. As I said, we just rewire the inputs according to the function pi. Uh, so if we assume that, for example, f only depends on the first three uh, inputs, then we clearly see that uh, pi of f only depends on x and y. So, so we have this exact correspondence. That f, if f only depends on s, then pi of f only depends on pi of s. We'd like something similar for our smack sets. Unfortunately, it's not true. So, for example, uh, if f has a smack set uh, as here, so there is some input b1, b2, a, 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 with output a. Um, then the problem is this input is not of the form x, x, y, y, z in general. And this means we cannot deduce anything about the function pi of f. Instead, we have something in the other direction. If pi of f has a smug set s, then the pre-image of that set is a smug set of f. And you can check that easily. Uh, if you have this input at the bottom, b1, a, b2, then this induces an input vector at the top, b1, b1, a, a, b2. And we see that uh, if the set of a's at, at the bottom is smug, then the pre-image of it is a smug set at the top. So we have this implication. The problem with it is that we're interested in selecting a small set of inputs. Um, and if we, even if we knew that the smug set S is small, the set at the bottom is small, then the pre-image of that set, it doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be small at all. It could be very, very large. Uh, so what can we show? So as I said, we show that we can show that if S is smug, then the pre-image is smug. Uh, we can also show that every polymorphism has some small smug set uh, of bounded size, and we can also show that there aren't many disjoint smug sets in any polymorphism. Uh, I won't show the proofs of that. Uh, these are quite tricky and quite specific to our problem. Uh, so let's just assume these are true for now. So we have an input, uh, sorry, a label cover instance here. L1, L2, L3, some label sets, some functions between them. And we've selected in L3 a small smug set uh, in green. We can look at this pre image, and we've also selected some small smug set in L2. And in general, it's going to be disjoint from that pre image. We look at its pre image, and again, we have some small smug set in L1, which could be disjoint from all the others. But we can repeat this over and over, and we see that at the top we always have those uh, smug sets, those pre-images of smug sets, which are disjoint, and therefore also smug sets. Uh, and we cannot have too many of them, so we know that at some point some two of them have to intersect. So this is what we can show. We can show that for every chain of length k in the label cover instance, there are some two levels here are L1 and L3, such that uh, the small smug set we've selected for one level intersects the one we selected for the other level after applying the function pi. And this is the version of label cover we have to show is NPR. In fact, we show something even slightly stronger. Uh, given a fully satisfiable label cover instance, it is NPR to find an assignment such that at least epsilon of all k chains have at least one satisfied error. So the gap here is even larger than in um, the PCP theorem. Uh, if the instance is fully satisfiable, then this means that in every k chain, every error is satisfied. And instead, we require something very, very weak that uh, in a small fraction of all k chains, just one error per chain is satisfied. And even this weak, weak condition is, is NP-hard, as it turns out. But the proof is not very hard. It uses known tools. Uh, essentially, we start from the PCP theorem and we do uh, parallel repetition. So once we know this statement, it's fairly easy to show. And this ends the proof. This shows that uh, our problem, we started from the set-set problem, 
is NP hard. So that's how the framework works. We have to look at polymorphisms of set set. We have to show that in some sense they distinguish a small sets of variables. Uh, we have to understand how the small, cell, small sets of variables behave and then we get some version of label cover and we have to show that this version of label cover is in beyond. That's the general framework. So I will end with some open questions. One question is, can we reconcile the analytic methods with the algebraic framework? Uh, so in approximation theory, analytic methods such as Fourier analysis um, or just probability theory or just basically any quantitative methods uh, have been very, very successful, very powerful uh, for, for hardness of approximation. And here we made it a point to avoid them, to introduce new methods, but uh, it would be very interesting to, to merge the two. If you're looking for some specific problems, then of course there's the promise coloring problem, which is still open. So for example, uh, is k-coloring a free color will graph and be hard for k at least 6? Uh, it's conjectured to be NP hard always, uh, but we really don't know. A similar problem is with promise graph uh, homomorphism. For example, uh, for coloring a graph that admits a homomorphism to a long odd cycle. And I mentioned this problem because polymorphisms here, uh, we know the polymorphisms here are similar in some way to continuous maps from the L-dimensional torus to the projective plane. Uh, so it seems that algebraic uh, topology could be very, very successful here. The problem is we just don't know algebraic topology too well. So if you want something more uh, combinatorial, uh, there's for example many hypergraph coloring problems. Uh, there's many variants, many results, many open questions. And last but not least, I wanted to mention that this is not only about uh, proving hardness, uh, hardness of approximation is also about algorithms. So, for example, Bracken Zeke and Cruz Fermi recently showed that a certain combination of two algorithms works very well. So, the first algorithm is essentially linear programming. I mentioned that uh, when discussing those label covered variants, and there's some things on L could be distributions on L, and that this variant of label cover can be solved in polynomial time uh, by linear programming. And some problems can be reduced to that version of label cover, and therefore they are solvable in polynomial time. This is one way of showing that things are solvable in polynomial time. And this is possible, for example, for a set sort problem when g over k is below this threshold. This is solvable by linear programming. This can be rephrased as choosing uh, those weights, WL, uh, real non negative weights, that sum to 1. This is what a distribution is. Uh, in similar vein, instead of uh, real non-negative weights, you could ask for integer weights. Uh, that's some to one. And then this this version is again solvable in polynomial time, Bogusian elimination, and this again solves some other CSP problems. And it turns out uh, that if you merge those two, if you do the two at the same time, with this condition at the bottom, then this is still solvable in polynomial time, and it turns out this solves many more problems. So the hope is, uh, with with ideas like this, we can find uh, simple but very general algorithms that solve many different CSP problems. Thank you for listening.